اوكي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته آه الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله last time we finished with surah fatir surah number 35 and today inshallah we are resuming from the beginning of surah yasin which is surah number 36 Surah Yasin is a Makki Surah, which means it was revealed in Mecca. And the, the hadith, uh, several statements by the Prophet وسلم, mention that Surah Yasin has very good effect on us in this life, even as we are dying. It is related that the Prophet وسلم, said that uh, if anyone recites Surah Yaseen and he is facing difficulties, Allah will ease those difficulties. If anyone recites it, before he goes to bed, which means at night, then he will have a good night. And if anyone recites it in the day, he will have a good day. And there are several other hadith that also mention that reciting Surah Yasin on somebody who is in the process of dying will make his death easy. So it is obvious that Surah Yasin has lots of benefits uh, and blessings. One of the things that I would like to remark here is that Surah Yasin starts off with two letters, Ya and the letter seen. Those letters are part of the secret letters, picking some letters from the Arabic language and having them in the beginning of certain surahs is regarded as a miracle, a challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is challenging the eloquent Arab poets and writers and laureates of their time to come with something like it. By putting those letters in the beginning of some surahs in the Quran, Implicitly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling these people the Quran is made from those surahs. And those surahs are made of Arabic letters, like the ones you see. Could you come up with something like it? Could you come up with 10 surahs like it? Could you come up with one surah like it? And those challenges are mentioned in the Quran. In the beginning of our interpretation, we went uh, through the first challenge the Quran puts in terms of sequence in Surah number two, where Allah SWT says, if you have doubt about what we have sent down to our servant, bring one Surah like it. That challenge continues until today. Nobody could come up with something similar to the Quran. Also in the Hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu says that Surah Yasin is the heart of the Quran. It is the core 
of the Quran. So it is very important that uh, we study the surah and continue to uh, read it and understand why does it have these values. So inshallah, as we are going through the surah, we will get to know why Surah Yasin in particular is regarded that very highly with a lot of blessings. I'm sorry, I have to blow my nose, I'm sorry. Could you please ask them to mute the mics? So from the beginning of Ayah 1, it says, yeah, seen. And then it immediately follows with Ayah number 2 saying, Wal Quran al Hakim, by the Quran, which is full of wisdom. Wisdom is not just in judgment. Wisdom in the Quran refers to not only the structure, not only the formation, not only the physiology, but the wisdom in introducing the faith and the wisdom in the laws it provides, wisdom in the evidence and proofs it provides. So the Quran is full of wisdom from beginning to end. It's amazing that Allah describes himself as Al-Hakim, the wise, and it describes the Quran, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Quran also as Al-Hakim. So this is a book who takes the description of Allah, the one who sent it down, the one who formatted, the one who sent down the Quran for the humans to follow it. So the Quran is wise based on the fact that Allah describes it as the wise. We know that the Quran is named the Quran because it is the book that is most recited, most read. Imagine how many people memorize the Quran and how many people read the Quran in part or as a whole every few days. So this is a book that when you read, you could never be bored. You could never get tired of reading it. And it keeps giving you the more you read it. It keeps adding to your knowledge, to your comfort, to your optimism, to your blessings. It keeps giving you. And it's never short of giving answers to any existential questions. Why are we here? Who brought us here? What is our mission on earth? What should I be doing in regards to this issue or that issue or that issue? The Quran and added to it the Sunnah are never short of answering. And the wow in the beginning of Ayah 2, Wal Quran, is called Wow Al Qasam, the wow of swearing. It is a tool of the language for swearing. Like when you say Wallahi. Here Allah is swearing by his book. And when Allah swears by something, it means 
it is great enough that Allah wants to draw our attention to it and wants us to study it, learn from it, benefit from it. So the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the skies, swears by the night, swears by the dawn, he swears by the time, he swears by the asr as a specific time. And whatever Allah uses in swearing, it means it has a great enough value and benefits that Allah is drawing our attention to, to study it, analyze it, and benefit from it. So in Arabic, when you swear, then you must go on and complete the swearing by what are you swearing to? Which is called in Arabic, Jawab al Jawab al Qasam, sorry, Jawab al Qasam. Jawab al Qasam here is, Innaka lamin al Mursaleen. The answer to the swearing, what Allah is swearing. Two is that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is one of the messengers. It's amazing that Allah is not only testifying that Muhammad is his messenger, he is swearing by the book, which is his word, that Muhammad is a messenger. This is as conclusive a statement of testimony as it can get. So Allah is in effect saying, I swear by the Quran, which is full of wisdom, that you, Muhammad, are one of the messengers. Messengers of whom? Messengers of Allah. So now Allah is not only confirming that Muhammad is a messenger, he is also confirming that the Quran itself is also the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After all of this, anyone who continues to doubt the Quran, it means they are just troublemakers, they want to put themselves in trouble and they want to confuse others. They are confusion makers and creators of confusion. Why? Because if I send you a book with all the evidence and signs that it is my book and I give you all those evidence and you could read them and then I swear that it is from me and I swear that the one carrying it is sent by me, what else do you need of evidence? And number four, it says, on a straight path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now describing the religion itself. So now the Quran, the messenger, and the religion, the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here described as the straight path. You know that the straight path is the shortest distance between two points. As if Allah is saying, if you want to, re to reach me the fastest, follow the straight path. If you want to get to paradise the first, follow the straight path. If you want not to be deviated or deviant or lost, follow and stay on the straight path. As if when you put a train on two tracks, the train must stay on the track to get you where the tracks take the train to your destination. So Allah is describing 
the Quran as the straight path, that Prophet Muhammad is on a straight path as a leader. And effectively he's telling us, follow that leader and stay on that straight path to reach where Prophet Muhammad is going, which is ultimately to the best place in paradise. Okay, then ayah number five, it says that this is the revelation sent down by the Almighty, the most merciful. So two things to mention here. One, that this book is revealed, it is sent down. And that it is sent down by Allah the mighty one, the mighty one who is also the most merciful. This is quite amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would, uh, would make us understand easily in few words, what is this book? This book is the revelation of the mighty one and the most merciful one. You see, in, uh, in the description of the Quran, in the beginning, Allah says that the Quran is full of wisdom. Here he is saying that he, Allah, is full of might and full of mercy because it is the revelation of the mighty one, the merciful one. So the ultimate purpose of the Quran is to guide us. So what might is Allah referring to here? The power of conviction, the power of reasoning, the power of logic the power of consistency, the power of truth, and the power of influence, and the power of blessings, all are included in that book. And the ultimate purpose also is to give us his mercy. For Allah to give us his mercy, he sent down the Quran and he also kept the Quran for us. He says, it is we who have sent down the Quran and it is we who will keep it. So if Allah is preserving the Quran, should we still have discussions about whether Allah has preserved the Quran? As believers, we should not. And if we're talking about disbelievers and the need to convince them, well, we need to show them the evidence and not argue about whether the Quran is from Allah or not. then the purpose of the Quran being revealed to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi this is his commission, ayah number six. It says, in order that you may warn a people whose forefathers were not warned. So they are heedless, they are inattentive, they are oblivious. In this ayah, in ayah number six, Allah gives the Prophet his commission as a warner to warn his people and to warn the human race as a whole that has not received a warner before him. Remember, the Arabs in particular did not receive a warner 
for a long time between Ibrahim and Ismail's time until the Prophet Muhammad's time. And then ayah number seven says that indeed the word of punishment against them has come to pass. And many of them, the majority of them would not believe. And that was true. The majority of the Arabs did not believe then. It took generations after generations for the Arabs to turn into majority Muslims. But in the beginning, Mecca itself did not have so many people until the Prophet came back from Medina. Then they came to Islam in droves. So in description for the condition of the people of Mecca, which as regarded as the Prophet's immediate community, about whom Allah says that the judgment of Allah has come to pass that the majority of them would not believe. Of course, nobody forced them not to believe. All evidence were presented to them and to others. But the minority believed and the majority did not. So ayah number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, definitely we have put on their necks iron collars reaching to chin so that they, their, head, their heads are forced up. It is like this. The chain is, yes, it's holding their heads up. And then, of course, this is uh, a description of their situation on the Day of Judgment. But in this life, everybody is free. Okay? And number nine, and we have made and put barriers before them and a, another barrier behind them. And we have covered them up so that they cannot see. So it is not only covering their eyes, it's covering them whole. The barrier that Allah has put, it is a barrier of blindness. And the usage of the words is important to be explained. When they used to hear the Prophet وسلم, they used to put their fingers in their ears and to cover their eyes with their clothing so that they do not see as if they are turning him off, telling him, we, we can't stand you. We don't wanna hear you. We don't wanna even see you. So, they blinded themselves by giving the message a blind eye and a deaf ear. This is why the usage of blindness and deafness in the context of kufr, it is because a person who understands the message, it should open his eyes. When he turns his eyes closed, he is turning himself off as blind. When a person hears the message and he understands what the message is, and then he puts his own fingers in his own ears and refuses to listen, he turns himself into a deaf person. So I wanted just to explain that those descriptions in the Quran are not talking about 
physical blindness or physical deafness. It is referring to the insight's blindness and the heart's deafness. And number 10, it says, and it is the same for them, whether you warn them or you don't warn them, they will not believe. Of course, the word they in the Quran, in most cases, refers to the majority of the community or the majority of people. It does not refer to every individual person because among those people are individuals who started to come to Islam after they saw the sign that indeed this prophet is supported by Allah. Otherwise, how come he and his followers are only less than 30% of the enemies and they defeat them? So people started to believe that this man is supported by God. And they started to believe, but only as individuals, okay? The largest number of people who embraced Islam came after the conquest of Mecca. Mecca was the house of the most ardent enemies of Islam. So a number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you can only warn him who follows the reminder, who listens to the Quran and fears the most beneficent, Allah, the unseen. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the prophet in the rest of the ayah, so give the good news to such a person, give them glad tidings of forgiveness if they believe and a generous reward if they die, if they live and die as believers. Now, the ayat will shift gear and it will start to give us an introduction to the following section. And number 12, it is we who give life to the dead. And it is we who record what people have advanced for themselves. And we also write their footsteps and the traces they leave in this life. Like for example, their footsteps to the mosque, their footsteps that they take to reach out to an orphan, the footsteps they take to help uh, an elderly lady or man. The footsteps they take to fight the enemies who are attacking their community. So if the footsteps are written and the, the, the traces of the footsteps are recorded, then the works that we do, all of it are actually recorded. And then it says, and we have recorded with numbers everything in a clear book. It also means that, it also means that the, uh, what is written is not only the good deeds, but also our evil deeds are recorded. So this is something that we need to consider. This is something that we need to 
try to figure out how do we deal with those records on the day of judgment? When Allah faces us with those records in our own book, and he tells us, read your own book, how? It will be definitely shameful to be exposed with evil and bad deeds, bad mouthing people, bad mouthing you know, uh, the gifts of Allah has given us in the form of husbands, wives, children, in-laws, parents, all of the people that Allah puts in our life, the vast majority of them are initially a gift from Allah. Then it depends how we deal with them that may turn them into enemies. So that clear book that bears record of our action is something that we will have to face. So in this ayah, Allah has told us that keeping the record is his. Reviving the dead is on him. Recording our deeds is on him. To keep everything in a clear book is on him. Why is the Quran taking text to point those issues? It is because some of us, despite knowing all of this, are preparing excuses still for not doing the right thing. Rather, we should ask Allah to forgive us we should ask Allah to forgive us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is further pointing to us by giving us examples. So in the following section, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gonna give us the example of a village or a town about the dwellers of this town. So he says, and put forth to them the similitude of the story of the dwellers of the town. When there came unto them messengers, When we sent to them two messengers, they belied them. So we reinforced them with a third. And they said, verily, we have been sent to you as messengers. What did the dwellers of the village say to these messengers? They said, no. You are only human beings like us. And the most beneficent has revealed nothing. You are only telling us lies. Can you believe that? That messengers come in twos, in ones, and the people continue to reject every batch of prophets, they, they just keep rejecting them. The messengers answered them, ayah number 16, saying, our Lord knows that we have been sent as messengers to you. And our duty is only to convey plainly and clearly the message. So they identified themselves as messengers and they identified their mission as conveyors of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what answer do they get? Ayah number 18, people said, for us, we see an evil omen coming from you. If you cease not, 
we will surely stone you to death and a painful torment will touch you from us. An omen is people sensing either optimistic or pessimistic about something. So the recipient of the message, the people of the village, they would say to their messengers that we are not recognizing you as messengers, you are lying to us, and we get a bad vibe from you. Bad omen, we don't feel secure having even you among us. And if you do not stop your conveying your message that you call message, if you don't stop, we're going to stone you to death and a severe punishment and torment, a painful one will touch you, will fall upon you. The messengers answered them saying, your omens, your evil omens are with you because you are admonished, nay, but you are a people of transgression and crossing limits, and you have no respect for no bounds. Then there came a man, a number 20, from the farthest part of town saying, O oh, my people, obey the messengers. Obey the one who does not ask you for any pay or wages or reward, and they are rightly guided. And why shouldn't I worship him, Allah, who has created me and to whom you shall all return? you will be returned to Allah. And number 23, should I take besides him any gods? If the merciful one wants to harm me, their intercession will be of no use to me whatsoever, nor can they save me. You see, that believer who comes from the farthest point in town is coming to warn his community. He believed in this man. He believed in this prophet. He believed in these messengers that were sent by Allah. And he's telling them his own belief. These are guided people. They are not talking of their own. You want me to worship anyone other than Allah? Can anyone prevent my harm if Allah determined to put me through trouble or hardship? Could anyone stop that? No one. Could anyone intercede between me and God? No one. Nor can anyone save me. The gods that you worship are false gods. That's why they have no power. Then he says, if I do that, I would be in plain error. I would be really lost. And then comes the bombshell. He says, I have believed in your Lord. So listen to me. And between this ayah, ayah 25, and ayah 26, something happened that the ayat leaves it for us to figure what happened. So let us read both ayat again. Ayah 25, this man says, I have believed in your Lord, so listen to me. Ayah 26, it was said to him, okay, enter paradise. 
He said, I would that my people knew that my Lord has forgiven me and made me of the honored ones. So what happened in between A25 and 26? What happened is when he said, I believed in your Lord, so listen to me, they killed him. This is why the next ayah says, it was said then, enter into paradise. That is only gonna be true <clears throat> after death. And despite the fact that they killed him, when he is invited to enter paradise, he says, I wish that my people would know. I wish that they knew that Allah has forgiven me and has honored me. Look at this, how tolerant a believer is, how forgiving a believer is. They killed him. And as he is invited to paradise, he is wishing they would believe and join him. Then A number 28, it says, and we have not sent any revelation on his people after him. And we were not going to do that. It was only one shout, one blow, and lo and behold, they were all silent, dead, destroyed. They perished. I will have to stop here for my next class, which starts at this second. And I will ask your forgiveness if I have done anything or said anything. Uh, I also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our time together as a time of ibadah, a time of worship. Make your intention whenever you come to class that this is part of your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because seeking knowledge is the highest form of worship. Next to salah, fasting, zakah, and Hajj. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Heidi. Wassalamu alaikum.